Psalm 27 and 14 says, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Isaiah 40 and 31 says, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now I'm reading the English Standard Version just in case you're like, what in the world is he saying up there? I love the King James as well, but today is the English Standard Version. Psalm 62 and 5. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. Now the King James Version says in that, in that sentence there is, my expectation is from him. So my expectation and my hope is from the Lord. I want you to hold on to that for the rest of this message. Psalm 91, 2 through 4. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you shall find refuge. His faithfulness is my shield and buckler. His faithfulness is thy shield and buckler. All my life you have been faithful. These songs that are scripture, these songs that are scripture, I love music. But when you put the word in there, it's something about that shout. Because that's a promise from the Lord. It reminds you, in all my life, you have been so, so good. When I knew you were being good, and when I thought you had left me alone, and I couldn't hear your voice. But with every breath that I'm able, now that I understand that I was being kept, when I didn't know I was being kept. There's a violent battle raging around us 24 hours a day. Dr. Donald Barnhouse wrote a book about it called The Invisible War. It is the battle for your mind. And the battle is vicious. It is intense and it is unrelenting. And it is unfair because Satan never plays fair. The reason why it is so intense is that your greatest asset is your mind. I have seen what it's like when people are unable to hear God because their minds can't seemingly connect to God even when they want to. Also know whatever gets your mind gets you. One of the most important things we need to learn and teach others is how to guard, strengthen, and renew our mind. The battle for depression starts in the mind. The battle of distraction starts in the mind. The battle of unforgiveness starts in the mind. The battle of bitterness starts in the mind. The battle of doubt starts in the mind. There are many passages in scripture that we could look at. So let's go to this one, 2 Corinthians 10. Three through five. Before I read it, I want to remind you, you're here at church, therefore I'm going to believe that we're all telling ourselves that we're Christians, right? You're a Christian. You believe in God. You believe there's something greater. That was only two minutes, Pastor. No, somebody's alarming off. <laughs> we're all Christians, so we believe that Jesus Christ died for us, sacrificed his life for us. We want to live for him. So we come to church, we worship God, we do what we know to do, and yet there's so many Christians that even I know that don't pick up this word Monday through Saturday and may not pick it up on Sunday. They might just read it up here. So therefore, you have no ammunition to fight with you don't know who you are in Jesus Christ I think sometimes we know who he is but do you know who he says you are do you know the power that he has given you 
I think that is our issue. Verse 3 says, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of this flesh. They're not carnal, but they are divine have divine power to destroy strongholds. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. I'm going to read verse 5 one more time. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So though we walk in this flesh, we are not waging war according to this flesh. In other words, we don't fight with armor. We don't fight with politics. We don't fight with money. We don't fight physically what is spiritual. We don't fight physically what is spiritual spiritual for the weapons of our warfare are not of this flesh but have divine power to destroy strongholds that means we must destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God so when the enemy comes in like a flood speaking and saying things to you oh who do you think you are what power do you think you have you ain't nothing Remember what your third grade teacher told you? She said she wasn't that smart. And of course, sticks and stones don't break our bones, right? No, they don't, but we hold on to those words. 50 years old today, remembering how you were eight years old and somebody said something silly to you. And that thing became something that attached itself to your spirit. You've been walking 50 years not being who God said you are because of words. That word became a stronghold in your life. So wonderful. You're at church and you're worshiping, you're singing and you're shouting. You might be on the worship team, you might be on the keyboard, you might be teaching Bible studies yourself. But yet that thing that has been holding you captive 10, 20, 30 years is holding you captive because you became comfortable with it. It decided it was going to be a part of your life and you decided to let it. Because majority of the time we might read this, but we might not fully believe that this is for me. I might believe that this is for you, but you don't know my story. God can't work with this bishop. I'm 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 too dirty the things that I've done the things that I've been the things that were said about me obviously are true so I'm going to rejoice for you but I can't let this go the enemy has decided to take root in your mind and what gets your mind gets you a stronghold is a set pattern of thinking that is contrary to the word of God it is a mindset that is against the word of God worry can be a stronghold seeking the approval of others can be a stronghold anything that you make an idol can be a stronghold fear guilt resentment insecurity can be a stronghold I'm going to pause real quick. I want you to just look left and right. Just look at your neighbor real quick. Don't say anything. Just look at him. You see how perfect they look? Some of them smell good. Some of y'all even brushed your teeth this morning. You came ready. Now, as an evangelist, as a speaker, as a preacher, a lot of times from up here looking out, I can see people grasping what I'm saying. And sometimes I see people looking around hoping that the person behind them grasped what the preacher said. Because they're like, oh, he preaching now. I know he's talking to you. Because you as nasty as they come. I hope he's talking to you. 
come. Hey, who am I? T- don't, no, 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 no. Don't point. Don't point today. But won't you look at your neighbor now and say, he's preaching to me. Nobody gets out of this. He's preaching to me today. Today is your day to have those things that you told nobody. Maybe only you and God know. Maybe your spouse don't even know the things that you think about in your mind. The things that were done to you. But you come to church faithfully. You serve God faithfully. Yet you've got this thing that has attached itself to you and you don't know how to let it go. This is for you. What gets your mind gets you. In 2 Corinthians 2 and 5 or 10 and 5 that we read, it says, take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Take it captive means to control, to conquer, to bring it to submission. Make it obedient. Make it obey. Now, growing up, I don't know if y'all believe in spankers or not, but (laughs) my siblings got their fair share of spankings. I was the youngest. So when I came along and I realized what spankings did, I only got a few, really, like two or three. But when I tell you I remember, it's something about that backside that just don't let you forget especially when you you don't know what they're going to use this time. It's a shoe, extension cord, the belt, whatever's near. And grandma, go outside and pick your own switch. When I tell you it took me 45 minutes to pick a switch, because while I was out there, I was padding some places, so... And then she get your legs and you're like, Lord, have mercy. But I understand the point of that was this is what you did. Now, I'm going to make you obey or you're going to remember the next time you don't want to be obedient. So therefore, some of us got some good spankings that I still remember till this day. And those things I never did again. Now, taking thoughts captive, making them obey, making them submit to me means I have to find authority somewhere. Because it's not in my own doings. So with this flesh, nothing's impos- nothing is possible. But with God, all things are possible. So therefore, if I'm going to make these things, these thoughts, these these things that I'm battling obey, I've got to find a way to make them submit. In Romans 7, 19 through 24, it says, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see my members, another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So let's move on to Philippians 4 and 8. You probably know this one. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is any virtue, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on 
these things. That's in your Bible. That's in the word. Think on these things. When I begin to think of the things that I've struggled with in my life for years and could not find out how to let them go, I know one reason why was because I, I wasn't really full of the word, although I grew up in church my entire life. I didn't know what I had to fight with. But once I realized, and this scripture says, it's taking me captive. So if it can take me captive, I can take it captive. I can tell it what to do, where to go. But how do I do this? How do I do this? I do it with the word. Because remember, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. There is something much darker, much deeper that wants to take control of you so that you don't reach your full potential in God. So that you don't understand who you are in Christ Jesus. Matthew 19, 26 says, but Jesus looked at them and said, but with this it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So when we speak and pray the scriptures, we are coming into agreement with God and his power is released to answer our prayers. Maybe you feel like God doesn't hear your prayers or maybe you don't know what to pray for certain situations. Not only does he hear our prayers, but he also promises to answer them. When we pray in line with his word, he hastens to perform his word. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Sharper than any two-edged sword, which means you cuts going in, cuts going out. It will take care of what you can't take care of. It will do what it is sent to do. The word of God says, my word will not return void. Once I send it out, it will do what I mean for it to do. So saints of God, the power that you have, being children of the name, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with his spirit, you have dominion. You have dominion over every principality, every darkness, everything that tries to come against you. The enemy wants you to feel like your prayers don't avail. The enemy wants you to think because maybe things aren't going exactly like you think they should go right now. Since God is not answering your prayer right now, he's not thinking about you. You're nothing. Where's your God now? But then I go back to the word. I remember that story that says, let the God that is true answer by fire and what happened God showed off you remember the wood was wet and God showed off in the situations where you feel like you can't hear him you don't know where he's at and the enemy is fighting your mind he's battling you what do you go back to what I go back to is all the memorials that I built. All those things that God has already done in my life. It gives me something to stand on. I can stand on his word because I know his word to be true. Let God be true. And every man a liar. Let God stand on the word. The word works. So when the enemy comes against my mind, the only thing sometimes that I can do is this. I look back and I say, if God wasn't going to come through now, why did he come through here? And why did he come through here? And why did he do this? And then why did he do this? You're telling me the God that I serve ain't going to show up for me? You've come too late because I've already got some things stacked up over here. This is the God that I serve. This is the God that I know. So I'm standing on his promises. Not my own abilities, but his abilities. Because with me, all I can do is pray. With God, all he can do is come through. 
And when God comes through, my wife and I, we always say, some people say, God he showed, God showed out today. I like to say God shows off. God, he don't just show out, he shows off. He likes to do that for you. If an earthly father, a good earthly father, knows how to give his kids good gifts, how much more does a heavenly father, how much more? Maybe he hasn't done it yet. He hadn't done it yet. Anybody have any unanswered prayers in the building? Put your hands down. Anybody got any answered prayers? So you're telling me that God will answer prayers all throughout my life, but he can't, he's not big enough to handle this? He's not big enough to handle that thing that I've been bringing down to the altar every Sunday and then taking home with me every Sunday? You mean to tell me that the God I've been serving for 30 years, for 40 years, for 50 years, I'm just giving offerings and paying tithes and living holy and trying to live righteous for somebody who doesn't think that I'm worth saving, who doesn't think that my mind is worth, worth being free. God is not like man that he would lie, nor the son of man. He would repent. Yeah, he thought all of us was worth saving. He loves us all. He loves us all. It's hard to comprehend the love of Jesus Christ when sometimes you don't get that here on this earth. When man, sometimes your brothers and sisters. Let me pause for a second because I grew up in church so I can speak on this. Sometimes the worst hurt is right here in the, in the building. The people that you sit next to every Sunday and Wednesday and fellowship with. You want to know why that is? Because you do life with them. You do life with them. And the one thing that the enemy really wants to do is cause distraction and division in the body. In the body. So we come to church from Sunday to Sunday. We will get down here and I, we will shout bobby pins from one side to the other. The Holy Ghost full, like we had some church today. And then church is over, Pastor. And then you got folks that won't even talk to each other. Won't look at each other. Because of something you did to them 10 years ago. And bless God, I feel so good holding this grudge. This grudge is blessing me. I'm going to hold on to it until Jesus comes back and I'm going to go with him. You're going to do what? I don't know. It sounds good. It feels good to be in here and be a little snooty, be a little whatever you want to call it. Causing division in the body. And you're wondering why God ain't answering your prayers. You're wondering why revival's not coming to you? You might be the distraction. I didn't say you're a bad person, but there's probably something in your life that you hadn't dealt with that God is trying to get out of here. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Bishop Fulbush, I don't have a problem with you. You might have looked wrong at me one day, and I thought the worst. Pastor Jason didn't shake my hand last Sunday. And when I tell you all week, I had an issue with Pastor Jason. <laughs> I've been coming to this church for 30 years. I've known him since he was in diapers. And he ain't going to shake my hand. Oh. <laughs> we find any old thing to let that division, to let that thing settle in your spirit. And once it settles in your spirit, it takes root. And when something takes root, what happens? It grows. It grows. And every little thing that is connected to it, that's similar to it, that's like it, is going to feed it. It's going to feed it. And before you know it, guess what? We don't see you anymore. You decided to let something attach itself to your spirit 
whether it's in church, whether it's in your family, whether it's at your job, not realizing who you are in him and who he says you are in him and what he said he will do for you. That's the God that I know and that's the God that I serve. Many years, I grew up, I grew up in, in, in one particular church for 20, 20 or so years until I got married to my wife. I grew up in this church, amazing church, over a thousand people, raised by a single mother. And the one thing that I focused on for a long time was not having a father in my life. I actually didn't even meet my father until I was 26 years old, the day I got married. So all growing up, my church, my amazing church had father-son campouts, father-son this, father-son that, Father's Day services, all these wonderful things. And all of my friends had dads at church. Me, I had my faithful, amazing mother and myself. And I would have these men in the church adopt me for a weekend, adopt me to take me to this men's conference. You're going to go with me. And as amazing as it was, what stuck out to me most was what I didn't have versus what they were trying to do. So for years, that thing grew in me. My mom always said, Cedric, pray for your dad today. Cedric, God's going to save your father. He's going to get the Holy Ghost. He's going to live for God. She, since I was little, she'd tell me this every so often. Pray for your dad today. And so I would do it. Then as I got older, less and less and less praying for him. But I still believed, you know, somewhat, God, may, maybe you'll do this. Maybe you'll do this for me. Because I've seen you do all kind of other things. But throughout the years, my faith lessened and lessened and lessened. Just because... I pray every day, then every week, then every month, then every year, then maybe I would think about it every so often because maybe I wasn't good enough for God to answer my prayer. Maybe I had done something just like I believed my father didn't choose me because I wasn't good enough. Maybe things happened in my life because I wasn't good enough. And so I let this root grow and it grew and grew and grew bitterness unforgiveness tried to take root within me God knew my purpose he knew that I would someday be something whatever that thing was going to be but the enemy also knows it and so what he'll do is he'll plant that whatever it is and he'll allow it to grow put people in your life to help they let that thing grow. So for years and years and years and years, I just wasn't good enough. I wasn't loved. I had no dad in the house, but I had a mom working one, two jobs, being faithful to church, paying her tithes, getting us, get me to church. It, doors are open, we're there, literally. Some people joke about that. Church cleaning, we're there choir practice I was there sleeping under the pew until I was in the choir like that was just we were at church we lived at church and although I had an amazing church amazing people amazing pastor an amazing God the thing that took root in me and grew in me was what I didn't have and why I didn't have it so therefore a stronghold that I didn't even realize was there while I was playing the piano, while I was directing the choir, while I was at prayer meeting, serving on the youth team, teaching Sunday school, stronghold, holding on to it. I was comfortable with it. But I was never going to reach my full potential until I let go of that thing. So years and years and years and years go by. I spoke to my father on the phone maybe four or five times in 26 years. Never saw him except for maybe in a picture. He lived about six hours from me. 
never chose to come, never chose to be the adult, never chose me, invited him to graduation, didn't come, 21st birthday party, didn't come, didn't think, didn't come. I just expected him to not come, to not do, to not be. Yet, somehow I still pray for him every so often, still serve God, still did my best to do what I could do. So we're going to fast forward. My wife and I were friends for six years before we decided to get married. Um, she's a, she's, my wife is six years older than me. And we became friends. We met at a singles conference, and I was very immature. Still immature now, but I'm older. <laughs> so I didn't get the rest out until she married me. And I was like, we're good, we're good. So now I can tell all my jokes that she don't laugh at and do all the things. So... While we were friends, she always told me, she's like, I'm going to get married one day, and you're going to do the music at my wedding. She's like, and I'm going to have a church service. I'm going to have this song and this and that and the other. And so we, should, we planned her wedding together <laughs> as friends. Now, I am convinced that every girl from the age of two up starts planning their wedding and knows exactly what you want. The man just shows up and like, okay, great. You've already got this worked out. She had most of that worked out, but the songs we, we put together, and we were just like, you're going to have church. Yeah, I'll do your music. Yeah. Until, I'm going to fast forward the story. God hit me in the head and said, she's the one. And I was like, no, she ain't the one. God said, she's the one. I'm like, if she is the one, and we do this, we can't go back to being friends. Because once you cross that little line, it is done. <laughs> so, single folks remember that. So anyway, we decided that We've been friends for a long time, a good six years. We know most everything about each other. And the Lord spoke to me. I'll share that story some other time. The Lord spoke to me and said, she's the one. And so we talked it over, and lo and behold, she was the one. So back to this wedding. We got married in three months, four months, something like that, because the wedding was already planned. <laughs> Whew. Thank God. But we had a, when I say we had a, I have to describe this because there's a reason for all of this. The church sat about 450 or so. We had over 500 people at our wedding, standing around up in the balcony, just full. The platform, we had a choir made up of like four different churches, all of our friends that could sing. The wedding party, we had 12 bridesmaids, 12 groomsmen. We had a Kids carrying everything, Bibles, rings, like, you just, we, we got to have you in the wedding, so you're going to come up here, you're going to you hold this microphone, like, just anything. So, the platform was full, the church was full, co-workers from my job were there, co-workers from my wife's job was there, my, my high school Presbyterian choir director was there at this wedding that we had planned for a church service. So, I'm going to get to that part. So there's people from, from all over at this wedding. My wife had, had another friend from her job who was actually a, a Wicca. She was a witch that came to the wedding. So how we planned this wedding was most family or friends whatever that does, that's not Pentecostal, they're going to come on Easter. They're, they're going to come maybe Christmas. They'll come to weddings and funerals. So we decided that this wedding was going to be a church service. And whatever happened, we're going to get married. We're going to get married. But if you got to go back to the office, we're going to get married. But what happens out here, God's going to do something. So we had praise and worship. We had choir. We had the lovey-dovey stuff. So the day of the wedding, I'm standing out in the foyer, getting my boutonniere put on with my two best men and the wedding coordinator. And I look out into the parking lot. There's this lady coming to the door. And I'm looking at them like, okay, it's probably some of my wife's family because her family is huge and I didn't know the majority of them. And so they walked in and they announced, he announced himself to the bride, to the wedding coordinator. I'm the groom's father. I'm literally standing probably from right here to where you are. I heard him say, I'm the groom's father. And I look up at him like, <laughs> like, what do you say? What do you do? Hi, well, I'm Cedric, nice to meet you. You know, glad you're here. 
which is exactly what I did, because it was at the most awkward moment ever. But I shook his hand. I said, I'm glad you're here. Um, they're going to show you where you're going to be sit sitting at, because we're taking pictures, we're doing all these things, so I didn't have time to really focus, focus on it. So as soon as they took him into the sanctuary to get him where his seat was going to be, I stood there. And when I tell you every emotion that could come up out of me at that moment, the tears started flowing. I was shaking. My heart was pounding. And so my, my best man took me back to the prayer room and I just sat back there. And I'm like, God, today? This is the day he decides to show up? I'm like, I'm leaving my mama's house. I'm going to marry this strange woman who I don't know. And this is the day you want him to show up? And so I'm, I'm sitting in the prayer room looking at them. And it was, the voice was almost as audible as you hear me talking right now. And it said, what if you never see him again? Immediately, I knew what I had to do. I got up. I went and found him. He was sitting in the very back of the sanctuary against the wall, just kind of waiting. And I sat next to him and I said, I want to explain to you what First Apostolic Church means and how mom raised me and what we believe and what's probably going to happen today. Because I felt like God was going to move. I just didn't know there would be as many visitors as there were going to be that said they were coming. And I didn't know my father was going to be showing up that day. And so I wanted to explain to him at least before he got up and ran out of the church. <laughs> and so I, I told him what baptism in Jesus' name was and, and filling the Holy Ghost and worship and take all like a good 10 minute, the quickest 10 minute Bible study ever. At the very end of me talking to him, I said, as a wedding gift to me, I said, would you get baptized in Jesus' name today? I don't know where that came from, but it came out. And he said, sure. Now, I'm not sure that's what I heard. That is what he said. It had to register. And I, I said, I said, yeah. He said, yeah. I said, okay. I said, well, someone will come and let you know what you're going to do and when they're going to do it. It's probably going to be after the wedding is over and so on and so forth. So I got up and I ran out of the sanctuary and I went to go find Pastor Webb. I said, Brother Webb, I was talking to him so quick. I was like, I met my dad today for the first time. He's here for the wedding. He wants to get baptized in Jesus' name. Can we do this at the wedding? And if you've ever met Brother Webb, he's like, anything goes. Like, if he had chandeliers, if we're speaking from the chandeliers, sure, let's do it. <laughs> it's just that kind of person. I'm like, whatever. So I'm like, okay. So we have this wedding starts, okay? I sing to her as she's coming down the aisle. Actually, I howl to her because it was not singing. <laughs> it was the worst singing I had ever done in my life. I cried the whole time. And she got down there and she, we planned for her. She wanted to be in there for praise and worship. So I got her down the aisle, wiped the tears. She's down there on the floor and her wedding dress that went all out to he and did everything and she's down there in her slippers we're 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 worse we're, that was when Martha Menizzi and Israel Holton first came out like that whole CD your louder will be greater and another level and we did all those songs we did three worship songs and when I tell you those Pentecostals were Pentecostal and like they were they were doing the most that day and I was just like, it's a, God, there's a lot going on right now. It's, it is a lot going on. And then we did the little marriage stuff and the whole lovey-dovey stuff. Then the choir sang a little bit more. Then the end of the song, our song to us going out was, I believe I'll testify God's been good to me. Dude, like we shouted off of the platform. That's when the Bobby pins literally flying back and forth. We shouted so long. The caterer came out from the side. She was Pentecostal. Her crew was not. They all came in to see why I was taking so long. Then she comes shouting across the, the side. Over. We're all doing this thing. And then when that kind of slows down, Pastor Whip jumps up on the plane and says, don't know anybody to leave yet. And I hadn't had a chance to tell anybody, not even my wife, that my dad came to the wedding 
and that's him right over there. So she's finding it out for the first time like everybody else is. All of my church family who knew how I felt about Father's Day and never meeting my dad and all these things, all the friends that I grew up with, I didn't even tell them. So the lights come up, the church is packed. That's when I saw everybody and their grandma was there. They get my dad up to the baptistry and I'm standing down there with Rosalind. I said, how do I get up there? I said, I want to be a part of this. So she shows me how, so I left her at the altar. We were already married. I get up there. And we're laying hands on my dad. My dad gets the Holy Ghost. At a wedding. 20 something years of praying. Then he goes down in Jesus' name. He comes up, still speaking in tongues, and water is going everywhere, and so are we. The whole place lit up. The Holy Ghost was moving. God did the most. That scripture that says, exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. That's the God that I know. That's the God that I serve. There's nobody greater than that. So when you tell me now something that God can't do, I keep going back. But he did this. But you don't know my circumstance. But God did this. And then God did this. So what do you mean God can't do? I tried him and I know him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. What the enemy meant for evil. If you read that in the King James Version, we've been saying what the enemy means for evil. God will turn it around and work it for your good. That sounds good, right? The scripture says what the enemy meant for evil. God meant for good. That means whatever the enemy decided to do, the Lord allowed it. Because God knew that he was going to work that for your good. So I don't know what anybody in this house today is dealing with. The things that you shared with people and the things you've never told a soul. Yet it is trying to take you down. Bitterness, unforgiveness, self-doubt, hatred towards your brother, your sister, all of those things. I'm not good enough. My mom never liked me. My dad didn't like me. They didn't choose me. All of these things that we bring to church every Sunday. All of these things that we bring to the altar every Sunday. Bishop might preach a message. Pastor might preach a message. And it's really good. But you've gotten so comfortable with it that when you come down here and you drop it off, it's almost habit. I gotta pick it back up and take it home with me. Because I don't know what I'm gonna do without this thing. I've lived with it for so long. But I go back to the word. I can also go back to some song lyrics, which I'm gonna do. I remember standing on the auction block of sin. Satan controlled me because he had the highest bid. But the ownership was transferred way back on Calvary when Jesus whispered, child, I bought you so that you could be set free. He that the son has met set free is free indeed. No more chains of slavery. Truth has triumphed in liberty. So he that the son has set free is free indeed. So now I belong to Jesus. I'm a child of the king. I've traded those filthy garments for a robe of royalty. Those chains that used to bind me are now laying down at my feet because the devil can't make a lock that my Lord doesn't hold the key. The devil can't make a lock that my Lord doesn't hold the key. So if the Lord, my God, my Jesus says I'm free, then I'm free. I can be free. 
It's for me. If I'm not free yet, that means my time is coming up. My time is next. God's got plans for me. Can we all stand? Lamentations 3, 17 through 26. My soul is bearest of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings and the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers and is bowed down within me. Those things that I've walked with for years, those things that I've lived with for years, those things that I thought God could never do. And if he did, it was going to be for my neighbor. Not for me, because I'm not good enough. I don't deserve peace. I don't deserve joy. I don't deserve love. I don't deserve those things. But then I read, but this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the soul who seeks him, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Why? Because my expectation is from him. My expectation and my hope, the things that I know God can do and that he will do, I may not be able to trust my neighbor. I might have, you might have failed me once or twice or thrice. It happens. We're human. But when I put my hope and my expectation in a saving, loving Father, I can stand on that word. I can stand on that word because I serve a good God. I've got tons and tons and tons of testimonies. I share because I want to be transparent with the body of Christ because I want you to know that God will do it for you. God will do it for you. My last song lyrics I'm going to do today is this. You may know it. I'm just going to read it to you. Let him turn it in your favor. Watch him work it for your good. He's not done with what he started. He's not done until it's good. So let him turn it in your favor. Watch him work it for your good. He's not done with what he started. He's not done until it's good. So hello peace. Hello joy. Hello love. Hello strength. Hello, hope. It's a new horizon. Fear is not my future. You are. Sickness is not my story. You are. Heartbreak is not my home. You are. Death is not the end. You are. So somebody say, hello, peace. Hello, joy. Hello, love. It's a new horizon. Watch God work it for your good. Now, in the beginning of this, I did say that this is for everybody, and it is for everybody. But we're going to have an altar call right now. And I'll preface it by saying this. The days of worrying about what people think about you are over. It has to start today. Today, God sent me here 
because there is somebody in this place that needs deliverance. There's somebody in this place that needs hope. There's somebody in this place that has been struggling and maybe nobody knows it. And the Lord is speaking to you today, right now. It doesn't matter if you are the pastor of this church, the usher that works the parking lot, your own staff. Today is your day to not think about what anybody thinks about you. I want some desperate people to come find their way down to this altar. You've been praying some prayers. You've been asking God to do. And today God is going to work something out for you because what the enemy meant for evil. Get down as close as you can. Let's make room. Get down as close as you can. Lord, you're going to do the impossible today. What seems to be impossible. What seems to be impossible, God. With you, all things are possible.